Friends, we are a people terrified of the word yes. The Monday before Thanksgiving, the Times ran a story, the title of which was, How to Say No This Holiday Season. As someone raised in the South, according to whose syrupy, drawl-riddled conventions, no is not only impolite, but downright cruel. I was jumping at the opportunity to be educated into a little Yankee candor by the New York Times. There are apparently six ways to say no to an invitation to a party or a shindig or what have you. The first of which is simply to be honest. What a thought. Allah, I really need a night in tonight, so I'm sorry I have to decline your invitation. That seems like a really healthful, healthy one, albeit one I've actually never used. I doubt you have either. They escalate, actually, all the way up to option six. Somewhere in the middle, like three or four, is just straight up lying. Like, <coughs> I'm sick. Uh, but option six is my favorite, actually. It's straight up panic and mania. Oh my gosh, I can't do one more thing, okay? Please don't invite me to anything else. And I think that's brilliant because it actually makes it their problem, not yours. The article, the article hilariously illustrates our culture's hesitance to commit. If you're like me, you're terrified, really, of RSVPs. And if our experience here at the church is an indi indication, you are like me. Because, <laughs> see, our calendars are already so filled to the brim that panic and mania might actually be the honest response to questions like, what are you doing next weekend? Would you like to come over, have a drink, have a cocktail, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> this makes for a fascinating interface, actually, with another trend in our culture, which is the fear of missing out, AKA FOMO. And that's actually a real word. It was added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 2013. Diagnoses of FOMO, Lay the blame at the feet of social media. See, when we attend parties and the like, we see immediate evidence of it online. Proof of our attendance and all of the fun that we had and that. Our addiction to the proof that we had fun. Corroborated by the number of likes or retweets said proof receives. That is the beating heart of FOMO. It also, conveniently, has the effect of showing everyone else just how much fun we were having, making them envious because they weren't. It's like keeping up with the Joneses, except it's no longer about the Joneses' car or the Joneses' house. It's about their relationships, their families, and their social lives. Now, it might seem like FOMO and our fear of RSVPs are in a profound contradiction. If we really felt the fear of missing out, we would RSVP to everything, yes, because we would be afraid to say no. Or else our love for answering RSVPs in the negative, canceling all of our plans, would be proof that we really weren't that afraid of missing out after all. But that's the thing. It's not about RSVPing yes or no. It's about RSVPing at all. It's about the fact that we are afraid to RSVP either way, paralyzed either by the sheer number of the options available to us or by the fear of missing out on something better, whether it's a better party that might come along, a better car, a better job, a better spouse. We often talk as if the over-busy, harried, crazy character of our lives is a function of overcommitment. That's often how we describe ourselves. We are overcommitted. That's why our calendars are so full. It's not. It's a function of undercommitment. We throw away our lives, pouring them into a thousand tiny thimbles, because at bottom, we don't actually know what our lives are for. This is a serious loss to us because meaningful life is the product of commitments of an overriding and enduring sort. Precisely the sort of commitments we are most afraid of today. 
They are commitments that make you responsible to someone or responsible to something. Responsible to a spouse or family, to an institution or a community or a neighborhood, to a cause, a discipline, a field, or an art form, or to God. If you think for just a moment about what makes your life meaningful to the extent that you feel that it is, I think you will come up with things like that. The secret to a meaningful life is not saying yes to everything, surely not. But neither is it saying no to everything in the name of something like mere peace and quiet. Sometimes we talk about boundaries and saying no to things as if they are the end all be all of taking care of ourselves. They're not. They're an emergency measure, okay? You have to do that stuff. You need boundaries. You have to say no, because that's the bare minimum it takes to live a life that doesn't land you in the hospital. And many of us need a great deal of practice at doing just that. But surely there is more to life than just trying not to land in the hospital. The secret to a meaningful life is saying yes to something by implication of which you are willing and able to say no to anything that stands in its way. And not all commitments are created equal. Good lives are not made by commitment as such, but by commitment to the good. And for Christians, that means commitment to the God of Jesus. And we see exactly what this looks like in the life of Mary the mother of our Lord. And I have to say, I love Mary. Many of you know this. Some of you all think I I love Mary maybe a little bit too much. I love her not simply because I have experienced personally the power of her prayers to her son, though I have. And that's a great reason why I might love her a bit too much. But I love her most of all, I think, because she's just like us. Mary is exactly like us. She is human, and she is human without the benefit also of being divine by nature, as Jesus was. I don't mean to suggest that we can't relate to Jesus in his full humanity. Surely we can. Jesus also is like us, but Mary's not God incarnate, and Jesus is. Mary is not one of the three persons of the divine trinity, and Jesus is. Mary's just an ordinary human being made holy and faithful by the extraordinary grace which flows from the child who, when our story picks up this morning, is still in her womb. The same grace that makes us holy and faithful. Mary is a redeemed human being, the first redeemed human being, and she is redeemed, as we all are, by her son. And this is crucial for understanding any theological take on Mary, and especially important for any of us brought up on a certain Protestant suspicion of her. Affirmations of Mary are at bottom affirmations about Jesus and the power of his grace effective in her. Anglicans, of course, have disagreements about what those affirmations ought to be, but affirm things of Mary, we must. And we can see evidence of Mary's redemption throughout her life. But our story this morning focuses on two moments. Her visitation to her cousin Elizabeth and what instigated it, the Annunciation, about which we just sang in our sequence hymn. In the Annunciation, Mary says yes to God's mission for her life. Mary commits herself to the role given to her by God to play in God's mission of redeeming the world in Christ. And she does so in words that have been on the lips of Christians ever since. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Following the Annunciation, she travels some four days through the Judean hills to the home of her cousin, Elizabeth. And we have to imagine she was both overjoyed and terrified. 
and not only because she had been given a great blessing, but one which looked like evidence of fornication to everybody else, which make no bones about it, that's what it looks like. She was both overjoyed and terrified also because I think that's what it's like to commit yourself to God's will at all. It's full of joy and it's terrifying. It's laced with the sublime, with an excitement and awe that fills you with gladness, but that overwhelms you from time to time. And here, overwhelmed and full of gladness, greeted by Elizabeth with the words that became the Hail Mary prayer, she burst spontaneously into song, which is another reason, by the way, to love Mary. It's like she's in a musical. She says, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And everything that follows is a riff on songs from the Hebrew Bible with which Mary would have been familiar as a kid. Not that she's not still a kid at the moment when her story picks up. She's probably 14. But in particular, Mary's riffing on the song that Hannah sings at the birth of her son, the prophet Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Go take a look at it sometime over Christmas. It's really extraordinary, the parallels. She's drawing on songs she was taught in the equivalent of her Sunday school. See, in the Annunciation, Mary commits herself to God's purpose for her life. And in the visitation, she then gives voice to God's commitments to God's people. In particular, to Israel, to the humble, the lowly, the meek, the poor, and the hungry. The Magnificat, as it has become known to us from the first word of its Latin version, the Magnificat declares God's allegiance, God's commitment to those whom Jesus in the 25th chapter of Matthew calls the least of these. And in singing it, Mary declares it to be the meaning of her son's life. This is the commitment that will define him it is the meaning of her son's life. That is, the meaning of the life of God. It's sentiments of reversal, that the mighty be put down from their seats and the humble exalted, the hungry filled and the rich sent empty away, have been considered so threatening to the status quo, to the egos of tyrants, that the saying of the Magnificat was made illegal in India under British colonial rule, in Argentina under the military junta in the 70s, and in Guatemala in the 80s. I love it that this 14-year-old girl has literally made dictators shake in their boots. She ought to make us shake in ours. Mary's song raises important questions for each of us about what we ourselves are committed to as a people and as people. See, paralleling our individual undercommitment, I think, is something like a national or a societal undercommitment, exemplified in things like the attenuation, disappearance of our social safety net, our narrowing of corporate responsibility to nothing but shareholder value, our individualization of the risks of sickness and aging, as if when we get old and when we get sick, it's just for us to deal with as if we can help it when we get old and get sick. Or our default as a nation on any mutual and cooperative pursuit of the good. As your priest, I can tell you, you all have very different opinions about how to fix all of that. And I think that's actually a very good thing. But we can debate the means but as Christians, there is no debating the ends. They're all right there in the Magnificat, in Mary's song. God has come and is coming into our world in Jesus Christ. The question put before us at the end of this and every season of Advent is whether the meaning of our lives will have anything to do with the meaning of his. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>